what happens to us after we have a near-death experience? That's what we're going to talk about today. And there before me was the most beautiful man I have ever seen in my whole life. His eyes were wide, with excitement and overflowing with love and joy. There is no living person to ever exist that could match the beauty of Jesus Christ. He was perfect in every sense of the word. He ran to me, me to him. He embraced me and held me close. Who is the God of heaven? John Burke. Okay, I'm going to start out with a, a bit of a disclaimer here because this is way over my paper. If you think I'm going to try to force something at you or say something is true when I don't know that it's true, that's not me at all. And that's not the kind of church I belong to either. But I wanted to give a kind of a review of this book or a mention of this book. I heard him on a podcast recently, and then I started watching more and more interviews with him. And then I read one of his books. And then there's this shorter book that is called Who is the God of Heaven? Answers to Common Questions. But his other books is one is called Imagine Heaven, Near-Death Experiences, God's Promises, and the Exhilarating Future that Awaits You. The other book is Imagine the God of Heaven, Near-Death Experiences, God's Revelation, and the Love You've Always Wanted. He has a couple of other books that are part of it. And like I said, I, I listened to like 20 different interviews with them. So there are kind of two things in my life that are outside the Bible that kind of make me go, what? One of them is the Shroud of Turin. I don't know that it's true. I don't know that any of us know that it's true. I don't think it's important that it is true, but isn't it kind of cool? This book comes in at number two. We can't know because this is not the Bible. And he says, this is not the Bible. These are people's experiences. This is not gospel. This is not the word of God. But in his sense, isn't it interesting to hear about these near-death experiences people have? He started out as someone who was working with his father, and someone gave him a book about near-death experiences and people's experiences with that as his father was dying of cancer. And he started looking into this because it kind of amazed him too. But again, he was a skeptic, not a Christian. I think he was an engineer too. And he looked at over a thousand near-death experiences to try to figure out what is in common by them. What are the statistics, right? And he has stories, he says, from 70 different people in his books, from every continent, from every faith, ethnicity, background, doctors, engineers, and Many of them, I believe in his case, 48% of them, no matter where they are in the world, no matter what faith that they were, had a very similar experience. And it was very similar to what God tells us in, in the Bible. People who knew nothing about the Bible, nothing about Jesus, nothing about the end of the world proclamations saw this too. And so he didn't go into this to prove the Bible. He didn't believe the Bible himself. He made sure that everyone he put in any of his books or relied on for data didn't have monetary investment. There was a, a big scandal that there was a child, they made a movie into it about this child's near-death experience. And I think he saw purple uh, unicorns too. I'm not trying to make fun of him, but he was trying to impress his parents. And a big book was sold of it and a movie was made of it. And then it came out, no, I never really saw any of those things. So he wanted to go at it in a certain way to ensure that he didn't have people who had a vested interest in any of this. So again, not gospel. We can't say that it's gospel. And, you know, we'll find out, right? We're going to find out. But he tries to piece these stories together about these near-death experiences, focus on 70 of these stories, and then talk about how it changed that person's life. And a little bit on his point, too, now he's a pastor. He thought he was done with this topic. He felt like, yeah, I'm done. I, you know, I wrote two books about this. And then he said, clearly, everyone wants to just talk about this book. He knows and he says, you know, that God came to earth to save us all, that it breaks his heart when he is separated. He asked us to bring everyone home, to tell everyone. And our God is a feeling God who loves us and wants us to all be saved and all come back home to him. But then he quotes a quote from C.S. Lewis, hell is justice for the free-willed creature who demands that God stay out. We did not have free will, we'd be robots, right? If we couldn't pick the bad thing, it's always the question, why did Eve and Adam pick the wrong thing? Why? 
because God gave him free will. He gave him a door out of Eden. Don't eat that apple. The apple was a giant doorknob that led out. That means some people won't be saved. I mean, it just unfortunately means that. And I think that why this book meant so much to me is because I come from a family that's not Christian. And so I always wonder that question. Are are people given a last moment chance? Or is there no instance where the whole thing is presented to people? And I asked that of my pastor when I became a Christian, you know, because I want to see my dad again. I want to see my grandmother again. I want to see all my relatives again. It made me sad when I became a Christian, to be honest. You know, a lot of people feel joy, and I felt joy. But then I thought of all my relatives. And it, it was, it's so sad. And in reading this book, it's a little bit of wishful thinking. Because when I read this, I have hope that I'm going to see my family again. That when people die or people have near-death experiences, you know, time doesn't matter to God like it matters to us, right? He says that in the Bible. You might say that a person is on the operating table and they die within minutes, but that's our minutes, right? That's not God's minutes. God's minutes could be years. And God's time is not our time. And I think this gave me hope that there's a chance. Anyway, um, but I'm not saying there's a chance. I don't know there's a chance. And everything that I know says there is no chance. But this kind of gave me hope that maybe there is a chance. And let me tell you something that my pastor told me when I asked him this very question. He says, we know two things, that God is the ultimate justice. Crime has to be punished. But we know that God is the ultimate mercy, that he forgives and that he put his son on the cross and to death to have us forgive. We also know a third thing that he doesn't want one of us to be lost. So something must happen. What about the people who never heard? What about the people who are way out there? What about the people who were under a threat of a gun and weren't allowed to hear about Jesus because of the nature of their country? Something has to happen that makes it just and merciful. And so maybe this isn't it, but something is it. And so, like I said, it just gives me hope that maybe I'm going to go to heaven and see my father and my grandmother again. He is in Santa Barbara, California, and he said it is the headquarters for near-death experience research. This is John Burke. I mean, who knew there was a headquarter to near-death experience research? (laughs) But there is, and it's in Santa Barbara, California. That's also where the David Guzak, who I also like his Bible commentary, comes from. And he said that when in his research, 48% of people saw the same heaven, regardless of background, religion. 47% of people saw their family. 23% of people had a life review. We'll talk about that in a minute. And Dr. Steve Miller, who also does a little near-death experience, said that these are not the end times. You know, this is not the end where the wheat is separated from the chaff, you know, where God is going to strain the goats from the sheep. Is it the goats from sheep? He, this is not the end end, right? This, because at, at that point, when people are separated and those who are going to hell because they chose to go to hell, that's the end end. But God is of love, loves people. And we should always seek truth because he wants us to seek the truth. There's two different things about what they report about the area they're in and what they report about their time with God. And so he says there's borders, and certainly borders you can't go past, right? Heaven, this is not heaven, because only the saved can go to heaven, and only the people who are really dead dead can go to heaven. But there are people around. They are bustling all over the place. There's a lot of busyness involved. People are dressed in many different ways. Some of them have the heavenly robes, while other people are dressed in jeans and t-shirts. There are people you know, people who are part of your family who you never met, that People see similar things even when they're blind, when they're colorblind. And people have met, they said, unborn children who died and confronted their parents and said, I met my sister in heaven. Did I have a sister? And then the parent would say, well, yeah, we had a baby that did not live. So they're meeting people they don't even know. Comments on this entire uh, piece of it that most people don't want to talk about this at all. As he started to try to get people to talk about their experiences, they would clam up because it's embarrassing. It um, makes them seem stupid, he said, or makes them feel like people won't take them seriously if they say this kind of thing. So most people don't want to talk about this. And he tried to encourage them to talk about it because he's trying to do this research. Some people 
saw a grassy area. Some people saw a bustling city. Most of the people that he talks about when I saw them in live interviews, so I got, we got to hear some of the interviews from the people, said that there was a throne, that Jesus was on the throne. There was a gate, a narrow gate next to him, and high city walls. In one case, there was a fellow from India who was not Christian, who barely knew a lot about Christianity, so he didn't have a deep dive into the book of Revelation. I mean, when you're non-Christian like I was, when you know something about the Bible, you just know the basics of Jesus. You don't know how the kingdom of heaven looks. And he sees the narrow gate and he begins to weep and he goes, I want to go through that gate. Help me go through that gate. How can I go through that gate? So people have that kind of a similar experience. They also account that they are able to look at anything without moving or they can move. Like if you're standing there and you want to see a close-up zoom up on that gate, you can just look at it and see it more clearly. Or they could go somewhere else entirely. So some of it is moving by location and some of it is by just focusing on what you want to see. Some people record that they flew and people also have experiences in the room that they were partially dying in. One man saw a nurse take his teeth out and so he said, that woman knows where my teeth are. She took them out when I was dying. One woman, and I thought this was kind of interesting, was above her room, saw herself in her body. It, it, most people didn't recognize their body as their body as they were floating out of it. And she said, well, I was on top of this room and I saw a sticker on top of the ceiling fan in this room. If you don't believe me, go look and see if there's a sticker up there. Now, a person dying on a bed in a hospital can't possibly know there's a sticker up there. So she saw something in that room that was something that we couldn't see at all. That's part of it. So people have that experience of seeing the area. Not all people see the good things. Some people saw these horrible people saying, come with us, come with us, just come with us, and, and very insistent at first, and then angry and ordering and demanding. And he could tell that these were not good people, that these were not where you wanted to go. And so he kept waking up. I think he was going under some kind of surgery where he repeatedly was dying. And he wakes up and he says to the doctor, pray for me, teach me a prayer. I am in hell. So he wakes up a number of times and tells the doctor he is in hell and he needs a doctor to pray for him. Give me a prayer that will get me out of hell. And the doctor does not believe, is not a believer, and tried to dig up something in his memory from Sunday school when he was a kid and prayed with him that this, you know, this man would come out of hell and that God would save him. Like I said, this guy didn't believe it, but he remembered just a kind of prayer you would say in a church. The guy comes back and reports that he was now looking at paradise. Wow. I mean, and, you know, again, we don't know. These are people's experiences, <laughs> you know, so we, we certainly don't understand that. There was one story of a pastor who used to be a Muslim. He was a Muslim imam. He lived in a country that would kill you if you became a Christian. So he was an imam. He had a near-death experience. And he came back and turned his life over to Jesus. His mother was beside herself. I have failed. My son is now a Christian. My, my life is a failure. And then she had a near-death experience. And she doesn't talk about what she saw. The, the imam does but she became a Christian thereafter. I think she saw what he saw. So even people whose lives are in danger saw a similar view. Some things that people saw when they were there is that everything was made of light. Everything exuded light. Every strand of a hair, every bit of a robe, every thread, every piece of grass was light. There was no light source like a sun. It just was all light. Then they saw a man who was clearly Jesus. We would recognize him as Jesus. In some cases, he gave him his name as Jesus. But man with a beard, about 30 years old, was sitting on the throne and talking to people. And again, this is across all different religions. He exuded life. He exuded love. Someone said being in his presence was like being hugged by love itself. He would talk to people. He would smile. He would have conversations about them, he would say, I'm sending you back. Your son needs your help. Or I'm sending you back and I want you to love me every day 
and love the people around you. And the messages he was giving people were very, very Christian. I want you to love everyone. I want you to bring people back to God. I want you to know everything. I want you to teach people about me as Jesus so that they can come with you. In one case, someone said, go back, sin no more, and follow me, walk with me. So people are given what they're supposed to do when they come back. What people see when they see Jesus is they see, like I said, love itself, kindness, warmth, a man with a humor, but someone who, who insists on the truth. People bow down before him. People are brought to their knees. It makes me think of Paul, Saul on the road to Damascus, that when you see God, you're brought to your knees. And they hear everything in their own languages, their own cultures. The message is the same. And the person is always Jesus. It's not their own God. It's not their own background. Some people report having a life review And here's the interesting thing about it, is that as they go through their life, they say, and this is many people, not just a few people, they're reviewing the incidents in their life, but they're also seeing what the other person sees or feels or thinks too. So if you're having a fight with a friend and that ended your friendship, you see how what you said made them feel. And you would feel horrible about it because it's not God judging you, it's you judging you. Because now when you're in the presence of this truth and you understand it, many people said, oh, I understand now. I get it now. And then you're standing there in this honesty, in this truth, and you're able to hear and see what other people say. It has that impact on you because now you understand what you did to somebody else. Wow. Um, anyway, 23% of people have that. And, and God is right next to you the whole time hugging you encouraging you, giving you love so that you never feel so bad, but you understand at that point, you've hurt somebody, right? And again, these are people coming back. So they have something they need to learn. They say that God himself is tender and somehow all three of them talking, communicating, pure communication. It wasn't vocal, but it was honesty, purity of communication. And it was just inside. You didn't have to say a word. Sometimes would say, do you love me? And in the end, they felt in the presence of peace. Everything made sense to them. That they felt love. And they knew what they had to do when they came back. It said in many cases, people argued with God about coming back. I don't want to go back to earth. I don't want to go back to my body. I want to stay here with you. I want to go through that narrow gate. And Jesus would be like, nope, I'm sending you back, and here's why. They all recorded that time was not time, that there was no time, that sometimes it felt like they were there for a very long time, only to find out that they were near death for only mere seconds. And like I said, I don't know what to make of it. I hope that's true. I hope that at that moment that someone is on that verge of death, they get to stand there in the presence of Jesus and be shown things and understand things. Is it that last chance that they can accept Jesus? We know Jesus said he doesn't want anyone to be separated from him. Is this a last chance? And like I said, it's a bit of wishing on my part. I hope that's true. I really hope that's true. I hope people are given one last chance. But I do think it's important that we don't necessarily act like that's true. We don't know. Because we need to tell people about Jesus and not just think, well, you know what, they're going to have a near-death experience either right before their death or sometimes before it, and they'll have that opportunity Jesus will tell itself. Nope. We always have to be a part of it. Jesus has asked us to do this and asked us to share his word. Boy, I have to say, this has given me hope. And hearing that people will come before the throne, I started thinking, too, about the unforgivable sin. And again, I don't know, this is above my pay grade, but they talk about a sin of the Holy Spirit and what exactly is the sin of the Holy Spirit? And it makes me think, this is the sin of the Holy Spirit. You see all this and you still say no. I guess to me, it convicted me of this idea of why did you suspect anything less? That my hope in Jesus has to be more hopeful and more joyful. And this book 
just showed me one possible route. Oh, goodness. Anyway, like I said, I'm not going to act on the basis of anything like this. But deep in my heart, it brought me joy that maybe everyone at that very end is going to be brought before the throne, shown the narrow gate, and given that chance. But either way, I'm going to go still through this, knowing that Jesus is ultimate justice, ultimate mercy. He wants everyone to come back to him, and he can think of a good way of making that happen. My trust is in him. My trust in heaven is in him. And that's the end of it. And he called us all to do our part and to share the gospel with the world. (sighs) Anyway, like I said, you, you read it and you decide for yourself, I'm out. Talk to your pastor about it. That's a good idea. The common thing that was told and what I was told when I was an atheist, um, I took a class and they talked about near-death experiences and they said, oh, no, that's just the brain waves. You know, the brain waves right when you're dying, a lot of weird stuff's going on, electrical waves and drug chemicals, you know, in your brain, a lot of weird stuff happening. One of the persons that had one of these experiences was having brain surgery. And so what they do is they put a hundred decimal tone in their ear to ensure that while they're doing surgery, there's no brain activity, no brain waves at all, right? Because you can't have that person awake while this is going on. And so you can, you put that tone in their ear and then you look at the brain waves and make sure there's no response, right? That's how we can tell. We should keep going on surgery. And even a patient in that case saw the same experience. So it's not brain waves. It's not end of life uh, chemicals in our brain. What I heard when I was an atheist is, well, of course, there's near-death experience and Muslims see Muslim things and Jewish people see Jewish things and Buddhist people see Buddhist things. And in his experience and in his research, before he was a Christian, not true. In 50% of the cases, regardless of background, they saw Jesus and they saw the narrow gate and the throne of heaven. Right now in the Bible in small steps, we have gotten through the Gospels and are now in the middle of Acts. And this whole book has me thinking too, how did Peter go from being kind of lame and denying and not doing the things he was supposed to do to this powerhouse we see at the beginning of the church? How did in a matter of a few seconds, did Paul go from the man who would murder people, who got a writ so that he could go kill people, to the apostle he became? How does that kind of change happen? And in mere seconds, in all I can think of is this book and what people saw. The experience of being lucid, seeing God in all his glory, in his resurrected body, seeing the power of heaven and the Holy Spirit turns people on a dime. And he even says, you know, we don't know. Obviously, we don't know. But Thomas Edison, right at his deathbed, said, it's beautiful over there. And Steve Jobs, on his deathbed, said, oh, wow, three times. I don't know. I don't know what to make of it, but I thought it was an interesting read. I wanted to give you the chance to read one or both of these books. I read the one. I read the study guide to the other. And like I said, I found probably about 20 different YouTube video interviews with him and found another five podcasts that I listened to that he was on. And I can't get it out of my head. So again, it's not going to change my actions. I am going to act as if this is the end and we have to tell everyone now because I think that is really important to us. Like I said, deep in my heart, I suddenly have hope. I'm going to see my dad and my grandmother up there. Wow. Anyway. (laughs) So my challenge to you is take a look at some of these videos and just see what you think. I'm not telling you to believe it. I'm not telling you not to believe it. But look up John Burke, look up Near-Death Experience or the book Imagine God or Imagine Heaven and just kind of see what you think. If you want to tell me, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear what you think of this book. I would love to hear what anyone thinks of this book. Uh, What I thought was interesting is I read some of the reviews there, I guess there was a movie made of it. And of course, the uh, reviewers, you know, all poo pooed it and made it fun. And they, and they said something to the extent of, oh, you know, it's this audience who swear by the gospel of Colton Burpo. I don't know who that is. 
probably won't see the problem here, but those of us who are less inclined to believe might struggle to accept a handful of teary an antidotes and bizarre medical anomalies as compelling evidence for that Christianity got everything right about life and death. So on the contrary, such viewers are liable to be left with more questions and answers. Um, you know, it said even in this book that some people went up there and when Jesus was talking, they just heard thunder. And it reminds me in the Gospels that when some of the people with the Holy Spirit were listening to the Holy Spirit, some of them only heard thunder. I think it means we're so against it, we can't even hear the voice that's in there. Yet, I don't know. But anyway, thanks so much for listening to the podcast. I hope you enjoy this. I, again, I would love for you to email me and tell me what you think about this book. Please remember that I have another podcast, The Bible in Small Steps, where I'm going on a slow roll through the Bible. Three episodes a week, one chapter of the Bible per episode. I started out in Matthew, and we are halfway through Acts. We're starting to see the beginning of the new church and what happened to Paul. Anyway, have a great week. Appreciate you listening to the podcast. And remember, our walk towards heaven starts with small steps. And some of them are kind of hopeful and have interesting stories. 